Hello, my name is Santiago Cortez and I'm here to present our work titled Iterative Path Reconstruction for Large-Scale Inertial Navigation on Smartphones. This is performed by myself and my college Yushin Ho under the supervision of Yuho Canada and Arno Solvin. This work was performed in Helsinki at Aalto University. I'll introduce the problem first. Since the advent of Global Navigation Satellite Systems or GNSS People have changed the way they interact with the planet. They change the way they navigate the world and they store information about their environment. Detailed, high quality tracks have a lot of value, not only for navigation and guidance, but also for analytics. The combination of satellite positioning and other sensors can create a very detailed uh, track, but satellite information is not always available, especially when you're indoors or underground, it becomes it disappears, it's corrupted or lost. In our work, we use inertial information to fill in the gaps. Once the gaps go too large, usually these are start to misbehave and have a misshapen track. For this, we propose iterative filtering as a solution. Let's start with the basic inertial navigation. Integration of the inertial signals should, in theory, provide relative motion. We have implemented this in the classic mechanization equations in the model shown below, where you can see our state contains position, velocity, and orientation, and the bias terms of the sensors are there, which is very important. Note here that the bias terms in the state is what makes this a good candidate for a global iterated filter. As you know, global iteration only really sort of works when there is identities in the update function, which is the case here for our bias terms. However, these systems do not work by themselves. The errors accumulate very fast, not only you're integrating noise, but you're also integrating the gravity leaking into our estimation, so the tracks explode very, very fast. For this, we need multiple sensor inputs, and in this context, GNSS are very, very powerful measures. Not only are they bounded in accuracy, but they are also position measures in world coordinates. Our mix system, the INS GNSS, uses the GNSS for the large scale positioning and navigation and the IMU for the small scale precision. So the track has the shape of a walking track, for example. Sensor biases are one of the big problems with the system and estimating them properly is very, very important. The orientation of it is highly, highly nonlinear. The unit quaternions do not let themselves to linearizing easily. So the EKF becomes very sensitive to the linearization point. Our system has an EKF used to estimate the motion based on the GNSS and IMU data. It provides a good, a good estimation of the track as it moves forward, so your current position is roughly correct. Once the gap starts, the drift increases very, very fast, and when the gap ends, it usually returns to its almost correct place. In order to fix the track, we implement an RTS smoother. So we perform the full estimation of all the states based on all the data, which means that when at the end of the gap, the information of the end of the gap gets put back into the track, and that makes the track look like a walking track. This is better explained with an example. Here we can see the track moving along with a pretty accurate estimation snap to the road, and at this point, the signal of the GNSS is interrupted. If we keep moving, you'll see how the drift starts to accumulate very fast and the track loses sense and it becomes very 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 bad. Here at this point the GPS signal comes back so the track snaps back to place and keeps on the somehow correct estimation. Now after the final, the final state has been estimated we go back and do an RTS smoother of the whole track which puts the information back into the sort of divergent states and that makes the whole track look somewhat correct. After doing this, we use the well-established theory of iterating filters in order to fix the linearization problems and try to improve the track that was smoothed in the gap. As with most iterative filters, we use the result of the RTS smoother as the initial state of the AKF and iterate across the entire track. So here we show it as an algorithm, you perform the AKF estimation, then you perform the RTS smoother back, you replace the mean of the initial state with the mean of the final step of the RTS smoother, and then you just iterate. 
This is the same example that was shown before. I will present it formally in a second, but here I'll show just the iteration how it works. Uh, you can see the the EKF does the forward estimation and the RTS window does the backward estimation. Then the mean of the result is used as the initial state and then we just iterate. You can see that the track slowly moves. You can see the sort of snaps to the grid and it slowly, slowly improves. The global iteration doesn't get a lot of love, so it's nice to see an application of it. So let me show you some examples. We recorded a walk around a block using an iPad Pro. We recorded the satellite information, the IMU, the camera, and the AR kit, which is a visual inertial odometry. They are all synchronized and from the same device. Then we take the GNSS track and we cut parts of it in order to create gaps that we can control. So we skip a lot of them or we sort of subsample the track of satellite positions. This video shows the data capture. It's uh, 10 times speed, so it's quite a long walk. As you can see in the map, the, this is the AR kit, so this is the visual inertial odometry. It's very, very good. It's been, I mean, it's been released by Apple, but it sort of slowly drifts, and there is no way for it to correct itself because it doesn't have the loop closures that uh, more complex systems do. Here we can see the GNSS track. As you can see, <clears throat> the estimation is a lot more noisy, but it stays true to the road because it, once again, the GNSS has bounded accuracy, but it has no drift. In blue are the measurements which are actually used in our experiment, and in green are the ones that are not used. You can see that the gap is actually roughly 200 meters of walking, which is quite significant. So this is the result of the capture. Uh, you can see the uh, the track in the middle is the air kit. You can see the small gap at the end, that's the drift. And to the left, you can see the GNSS. In blue are the measurements that are used in our experiment, and in green are the ones that are left out. So the whole left half of the track has been cut. On the right is our performance. In blue is the earlier iterations, and then in black is the latest iterations. Uh, this is easier to explain with a video. So you can see that the first track is very misshapen and it slowly squares itself to the street. That's the biases of the sensors and the whole system becomes more so it converges to a shape that makes sense with the map. There was no visual information, only IMU and GNSS. So now to do some qualitative experiments. Um, it's hard to evaluate odometry tracks because given multiple sensor modalities and target applications, some may aim for something and some may aim for something else. A track that's good for navigation is not necessarily good at augmented reality. And a track that's good for augmented reality is not necessarily a good navigation track. You want to be in the right place for navigation, you want to have correct motion for augmented reality. So these are different goals. So coming up with a number to evaluate the goodness of a track is hard. There is not a agreed upon metric for tracks and odometry. In the SLAM and odometry community, there's still an ongoing discussion about what is the best way to sort of measure the goodness of a track or of a system. This is because not only are applications different, but the sensor modalities and the sort of scales of the tracks are different. That's why we, we propose the scale-aware RMSE as a metric. We propose a metric that shows the performance at different scales so you can pick which scale you want to choose and which scale you want to be good at. We chop the piece, the, the, the tracks into pieces of different lengths in time, align them using uh, least squares, and then measure the distance between the aligned tracks. So this is the result for our first experiment, which is where you chop the half of the GPS measures off. Um, you can see that the red track, the GPS, it starts comparatively very bad, but it evens out and it has a bounded error. The error is never going to increase because the GPS has noisy measurements, but they are noisy measurements around the correct mean. The AR kit, which is in purple here, starts very well at low scales, but once you increase the size of the track, then it starts to drift. 
and there is no correction, there is no correcting factor. It's never going to go back down. It's always going to drift more and more and more. The iterated filter, which once again has no visual information, is just inertial and uh, navigate in satellite data. The first iteration is very bad because the proper biases are not quite estimated and the system is very, very frail to this. So it has a lot of error in the gap. Once you start iterating, the biases get better and better and then the linearization error gets reduced and reduced. So these two contributions make the track almost converge to the same error as the GPS at large scales and it's pretty good at low scales too. This is a separate experiment. As you can see, the GPS and the air kit are the same. But instead of chopping half of the, tr of the track off, we only use a subsample amount of uh, satellite information. We use one out of every 20 samples to start and then iterate on that. These are measured against the ground truth, which is the same system performed with all of the with all of the GPS measures. So it's sort of the perfect case for our system. As you can see, this is a much better case for our system. Even the first iteration is already pretty good. That is because a large gap is a lot more harder to deal with than a bunch of smaller gaps one next to each other, which is what the subsampling practically does. Even though the first iteration is already pretty good, after 20 iterations you can see that it's converging towards almost as if there were no subsampling at all, which proves the power of the iteration. Here we see some of the commonly used metrics as they evolve with the iterations. They are not very useful to evaluate the track itself, but they can show us that the system converges. The first one is the RMSC and the second one is the mean absolute error. The last one is the negative log posterior density of the non-used GPS tracks. This tells us how likely the track is given the uh, position measurements. Of course, it depends on the noise and the position measurements itself, and that's why there is less convergence shown. Now we perform some experiments on a publicly available dataset. Uh, it's called the AdView dataset, published by us too. This is over one hour of walking in various indoor and outdoor spaces. The GNA signal was simulated because it was indoor walking. We just used the ground truth provided and subsampled it to sort of resemble the GPS track. And you can see that most tracks improve with the iteration, and then the mean and the median are also improved. For a few of the sequences, the iteration not only didn't help, barely help, or sometimes even made it worse. This is due to the very, very uh, difficult cases that are in the dataset, for example, elevators and escalators which are particularly hard for an inertial system since the speed is constant and there is not that much activation of the sensors. However, in general, it helped most of the sequences improve a little bit or in other, in other ones, it improved significantly. So to recap, GNSS signals are very, very powerful tools for position. They are accurate and usually more than enough to create a, power, a very very accurate track but they suffer from gaps in indoor spaces and underground. IMUs can be used to estimate a detailed track and to fill in the gaps but errors in various estimation and linearization create large errors in sort of an EKF. Iterated filters though can help mitigate this and extend the size of the gap of satellite measurements that can be fixed using the IMU. Thank you very much for your attention. You can watch our videos and materials on our project page. Uh, any questions or any doubts, you can send them to me via email and I'll make sure to answer as fast as possible. Thank you very much.